Um, first of all, thank you very much for being here today. Um, and thank you for, to our three panelists, not chosen on purpose by their names, um, whom I'm going to introduce um, uh, one by one in a minute. Thank you very much for being here um, today. So this panel is dedicated to the memory of Professor Simon Barton, former president of the Society for the Medieval Mediterranean, whose academic contribution to the fields of medieval Iberian history and Western Mediterranean studies has left important intellectual legacies in each of these fields. His influential scholarship examined the functioning of medieval Iberian systems of power, the value, interpretations, and cultural legacy of interfaith exchanges, including sexual liaisons and marital practices, along with the social, political, and cultural influence that they exercised in the multi-confessional context of the Iberian Peninsula. Professor Barton's research also contributed to reassess and questioning uh, the use of controversial historiographical labels such as convivencia, reconquista, which have often been framed within politically driven discourses. And I'm sure you're familiar with Simon's work from his uh, first book, The Aristocracy in 12th Century, Leon Castile, published in 1997, to his um, uh, last book, Conquerors, Brides and Concubines, Interface Relations on Social Power, and Social Power, sorry, in Medieval Iberia, published in 2017. But Simon was more than an excellent scholar. He was a friend, he was a very generous colleague, he was a mentor, as three of us can testify today, an excellent PhD supervisor, and he was also a very talented researcher whose vibrant and persuasive writing made actually his research accessible to the widest audience. And I think for all of you who know a history of Spain and the times that has been republished and all our undergraduate students who have um, read it um, is, is quite, um, quite a, a point. So inspired by Simon's influential scholarship, today our three speakers uh, will present their own research um, which engage critically with some of the ideas, the questions that Simon raised um, in his own work and proposing new, uh, uh, new ideas and new avenues of inquiry. I should say that these three contributions, um, along with other 14, hopefully actually 15 uh, papers, will be part of a forthcoming edited volume entitled A Plural Peninsula Studies in Honor of Simon Barton, uh, under contract with Brill. It will be published in the Medieval Mediterranean series, and it's a volume that seeks to reassess methodologies and approaches to offer a fresh insight into the analysis of themes and debates raised by Simon's work, becoming part of his intellectual and scholarly legacy while sowing the seed for innovative research pathways. So today um, we have here with us um, three lovely, amazing people, as well as being fantastic scholars that I met through Simon. Um, starting with um, Ferris Martin, um, I'm gonna give, trying to summarize her extensive biography uh, for those of you who might not know her, and I believe those might be very few. Um, since 2009, uh, Therese is a Scientifica Titular, a uh, tenured researcher in medieval studies uh, at the Institute of History uh, and El Consejo de Investigación Científica, el CSIC de Madrid. Um, she was previously professor of art history uh, at the uh, University of Arizona. She's an expert in art history, um, and she has studied extensively the role of women as makers of medieval art, which is also the title of one of her books. Um, and she does not necessarily gender studies, as we have discussed, but women's and history and studies, uh, um, and how this is reflected um, through also um, art and material production. She has been working on a number of fascinating projects, um, the latest of which is the Medieval Iberian Treasury in Context, Collections, Connections, and Representation on the Peninsula and Beyond, which is a project funded by uh, the Research Challenge Grant from, uh, by the Spanish Ministry of Science, Innovation, and um, Universities uh, that actually started this year and will go on until 2022. Um, and in this project, art historians, archaeologists, curators, and historians from six different countries examine the geographically um, charged nature of objects um, and investigate women as vectors of cultural exchange. 
So Therese has published extensively. If you don't believe me, try to open her CV on Academia and, and then scroll down and down and down and down and you will see. Um, and um, these are um, also, I mean, her research has been recognized uh, internationally and um, she's a great scholar. Um, so much that this has been uh, actually recognized by the fact that she has been awarded a number of uh, uh, prizes and grants, including a visiting scholarship at the Center for Advanced Study in the Visual Arts um, in Washington, D.C., that she's going to start in September. She's also been uh, uh, visiting a scholar at Stanford, UCLA, Princeton, Santiago, you name it. Um, not only she's a productive researcher, she also supports other scholars to publish their research um, um, through uh, her commitment as an editor in a number of academic journals. Um, and I'm just going to mention one because it's a kind of brother of al in the sense they're both uh, published by Taylor and Francis and it's a journal of medieval Iberian studies. Um, and she is, um, for, for all these, uh, very welcome today. And Therese is going to talk about uh, once and future queen, Urraca Redux 1109. Um, thank you very much. Thank you, Antonella. Thanks. I'd like to offer my thanks to the organizers for inviting me to speak in this session, especially Roser Saligru and Antonella Liutos Corpo, who have been wonderful hosts. It is an honor to join you all in remembering Simon Barton, whom I first met when he was finishing his PhD and I was starting out on mine. I later invited Simon to participate in the first sessions I organized at Kalamazoo in 2002, and he contributed a chapter to the resulting volume of studies I edited, a fest shrift for my advisor, John Williams. And I should say, uh, Eileen McKiernan-Gonzalez was also in the 2002 session and in the book, and she's here today. Our research interests often overlapped, and over the years, we would consult the other on matters historical or art historical. For the forthcoming volume in his honor, I will be taking a renewed look at Urraca of Leon Castilla, a 12th century ruler at the intersection of gender, power, and cross-cultural contact, whose reign fits neatly with the themes that were central to Simon's research. His superb article, Marriage Across Frontiers, Sexual Mixing, Power, and Identity in Medieval Iberia, published in 2011 in Journal of Medieval Iberian Studies, was expanded several years later in his monograph, as uh, Antonella has just mentioned. It was the absence of Urraca from Simon's book that became one of the reasons I chose to make her the focus of my contribution for his Feshrift. I began to study Queen Urraca of Leon Castilla almost by accident, and I give you some images now to look at while I'm talking a little bit about uh, the historiography. Here is Urraca, represented just a few years after her death in the Tumboa, the cartulary of the Cathedral of Santiago de Compostela. She's the only woman in the cartulary represented as a ruler. She's crowned and throned. She bears a scepter and a, a charter of her donation. All of the other women are uncrowned, even though that they are donors as well. Three of her crowns with... Um, with uh, uh, representation of the queen, sorry, three of her coins with representations of the queen. In the upper one, the most common, where she is a simple frontal bust with a uh, diadem. I think you can see. Uh, in the second, she's in profile, her hair flowing freely and a more magnificent crown. And in the third, which is very hard to make out, she's also frontally portrayed more of her um, uh, chest and shoulders are shown perhaps holding a scepter and with a more magnificent crown. I also want you to notice how different the legends are on each of these three. In the first, Rey could be short for king or queen. In the next, she's called Rexa, which I think is fabulous. How can we interpret that except as female king? And in the third, and this is the one that is doubtful as of yet, she's queen on one side and she's king of Hispania on the other. Now, I put a query there because I haven't seen this coin, so my hand is not in the fire for it, but I want it to say that. In the nine centuries since Urraca came to the throne in 1109, the stories told about this reigning queen, daughter of the fabled king Alfonso VI and mother of the emperor Alfonso VII, have ranged from straightforward acknowledgement of her role as ruler, to praise for her generosity to churches, to scorn for her womanly weakness and wanton nature, 
until she finally came to be defined as a despoiler of churches. After that, Urraca was nearly written out of history until Bernard Riley's pioneering 1982 study. With the publication of her charters in 1996 by Cristina Monter de Albiac and in 2002 by Irene Ruiz Albi, the floodgates opened. I fell into studying Urraca during the course of writing my dissertation on the Romanesque Church of San Isidoro in Leon. One of the most surprising results of that research was the discovery that this despoiler of churches had also been a major patron of the building. In 2005, I published an article to that effect in Speculum, and my book, Queen as King, came out the next year. Also in 2006, Maria del Carmen Payares and Hermelindo Portela published their book, La Reina Urraca, and since then, many studies have contributed to restoring Urraca to her place in history, including another monograph just last year by Angel Gordo Molina and Diego Melo Carrasco. In addition to the exciting research that has appeared in recent years, new coins have also come to light, which sparked my interest in Urraca's rulership. In this one, Urraca is shown full body, enthroned, holding a scepter in her left hand, and her right seems to be held out in a gesture of uh, command. I'm not sure about that. Um, there are two known. This one was sold at auction month before last in Madrid, and so we won't be seeing it again. It went to a private collection. And I should just say, I always use my ring for scale because if you don't have something to measure when you're seeing something and you aren't going to get another opportunity to take a photo, use something that you've always got with you and then you can get the measurements later. Uh, the eldest daughter and heir of Alfonso VI, Uraca reigned in her own right for 17 years and she struggled for supremacy against the kingdom of her estranged second husband, Alfonso I, El Batallador of Aragon. But her ambitious rule was cut short by death in childbirth at age 45. In my work on Urraca, I analyzed the abundant art historical sources together with textual evidence, asking how the things we see square with the words we read. This allows us to address larger ideas that are universally present in the ways history as a whole has been studied, including which types of evidence are valued and which are downplayed. I argue that objects and buildings open a window onto Uraka's aspirations. I suspect that Simon would have been as surprised as I was to see that in 2019 in Leon, a, a monument was erected to Queen Uraka. Such an honor would have been unthinkable without the scholarship of recent decades that had percolated through to Leonese society. The city is intent on recovering its medieval rulers, so they've also just put up a statue of Alfonso IX. A comparison of the two shows that there is still a way to go before her reign <laughs> gets equal billing with his. If materials are anything to go by, bronze versus reconstituted stone, to say nothing of monumentality. <laughs> Speaking of scale, I carry this with me. But it's a major first step. And beyond the statue itself, I was even more astounded to see how the news about it was reported in one of the local papers, calling her protector of San Isidoro and of the royal pantheon of Leon. If this phrasing doesn't come as a shock to you, it's because you've been keeping up with the scholarship and well done. The story that had been told before then, however, was completely different. From the 13th century on, it's been repeated that Urraca's penchant for robbing churches culminated in the despoiling of San Isidoro, during which she was struck dead in the act. And I uh, show you an image from the 17th century, because this was repeated over and over again, in which Urraca, her head still in the doorway, having been killed, has all of the treasury spread out around her. Now, this might be amusing were it not for the fact that this story is still in common parlance. The tale of the theft from San Isidoro originated in the 1220s with the writings of Lucas of Tui, the church's vengeance being added toward the end of the 13th century. Lucas had recorded a terrible event in the history of the Leonese monastery at which he spent most of his ecclesiastical career before going on to become Bishop of Tui. In fact, this incident was so traumatic that it continues to be the story told at San Isidoro itself. Lucas reports that Queen Urraca allowed her husband, Alfonso I of Aragon, to plunder the church of San Isidoro in order to pay his troops. He tells us, 
in very elaborate language that because the queen didn't have any treasury left, he said, we should sack the church. So, to this diabolical counsel and persuasion, Queen Uraka gave consent. And those abominable invaders, irreverently putting aside both fear of God and the abject shame of man, with the queen's permission, pestiferously entered the church and looted the treasures consecrated to God. Those workers of hell, satellites of the devil, infernal hammerers, broke everything into pieces, reserving it to their lords and their own wanton and villainous uses. Crosses of our Lord, chalices with Christ's consecrated body and blood, images of Holy Mary, Mother of God, and other saints, candelabra, thuribles, plates, crowns, caskets with holy relics, aquamanils, and many other objects from that church. And all were of gold and silver, with precious stones of diverse colors and great brilliance. And with this, those most impudent dogs, in their ignorance, were satisfied. So, a terrible event indeed. Yet something that should strike us is this. If Uraka allowed the sacking of San Isidoro, how can it be that the church still has a magnificent treasury, <laughs> some 30 objects and a dozen textiles on site, while another dozen objects are held by major museums in Madrid, New York, Paris, and St. Petersburg? And I can show you only a little taste of it today. But for example, the uh, textile above is one of the very few surviving embroideries. It's inside the, the reliquary of San Isidoro. We were able to do carbon-14 testing on it, and we're very surprised to find that it's from the 10th century. Um, two tiny, tiny uh, silver caskets from Al-Andalus, a magnificent ivory weighing almost a kilo. It's nearly two centimeters thick. Uh, sorry, yeah, two centimeters. Um, it's much thicker than any other ivories. Uh, in the center, the casket um, of, from Fatimid Egypt that can be dated to the 1140s, below the, the casket of San Isidoro himself. Uh, also, a wonderful ivory crucifix that's today in Leon, the chalice of the Infanta Uraca, otherwise known as the Holy Grail, if you've been to Leon lately. <laughs> also, a tiny little um, cordelman ivory, a, and as yet undated, and if anyone has any ideas about the object in the top center, I'd be very interested to hear it. Another silver casket from Al-Andalus, the only Viking object in the entire uh, Iberian Peninsula, a stolen maniple set by Queen Leonor, wife of King Alfonso VIII, daughter of, Leonor of, Aquit of Eleanor of Aquitaine. And I show you two of the details so that you can see the gold and silver wrapped thread, which was, it was magnificently made. And finally, because I cannot resist, gorgeous purple silk, an altar, a portable altar of the Infanta Sancha. So we have named objects with four different women and uh, a box that was put back together so that on three sides the ivories are the Beatitudes and the fourth is made up from two different Islamic caskets from the late 11th century with the inscriptions being turned to give it a decorative effect rather than legibility. So, this disparity between what we see and what we read, that is the disconnect between visual and written evidence, spurred my current research on the treasury at San Isidoro. The photos are of my colleagues and collaborators at work during the recently completed first phase of the project. And as Antonella announced, we've just received funding for a second phase, which by the way, includes a full funded PhD position. So if any Europeans are interested, please talk to me. How then can we explain the fact that there continues to be a magnificent treasury at the Leonese Monastery? Here, Lucas of Tui also provides an answer. But this chapter of the Miracles of St. Isidore, by contrast with the former, has not been assimilated into common lore. Lucas names Queen Uraca and her eldest daughter, Sancha, as the restorers of the church. In reference to the queen, the chronicler's tone throughout both the miracles and his Chronicon Mundi was extremely disapproving, which lends weight to this single instance in which he spoke highly of her actions. He said, Queen Uraca, in order to expiate the aforementioned great crime, and I remind you, it's of having allowed her husband to despoil the church, not of ha having done it herself. 
together with her most prudent daughter, Sancha, who from childhood affirmed that she had taken Saint Isidore as her spouse, refusing a husband's carnal coupling. With great zeal, they decided to restore to the Church of the Holy Confessor that which had been removed. In addition, the queen repeatedly proceeded to have many relics of saints zealously gathered from diverse parts of the world, and she had them placed with honor in caskets of silver and ivory. With royal munificence, she conferred many properties on the church, and during her lifetime, she had a burial place prepared for herself in that church with her forebears. So, can we believe either of these two accounts by Lucas of Tui? I would argue that we can. In fact, we can believe both of them. It would not be at all surprising that a ransacking of the church took place around 1110 to 1112 during the tumultuous commencement of Queen Urraca's reign. And perhaps she even allowed it, taking for granted her right as ruler to make use of or to bestow on another the objects within her dynastic church. These gifts had been given to San Isidoro by members of her own family. Although not all the earlier treasure would have been taken, it seems probable that some of the most highly valuable gold pieces were appropriated and that some reliquaries were profaned. A surviving charter testifies to the generous donation made by Urraca to San Isidoro in 1117. And as Lucas himself would recount in the Chronicon Mundi, she was indeed buried with honor at San Isidoro. Thus, his reference in the miracle to the conferring of properties by, by Uraka and the preparation for her burial there are both verifiable facts. Why then should the chronicler's identification of Uraka as the donor of, quote, caskets of silver and ivory to San Isidoro be dismissed out of hand, especially given the continued presence of 12th century objects of the type Lucas recognizes as having originated in diverse parts of the world? This is demonstrably the case for the ivory set of the type known as Siculo Arabic, dating from around the first quarter of the 12th century, which Silvia Armando and I have argued is, the, is most likely to have arrived in Leon as part of the marriage negotiation of Uraca's sister Elvira to Count Roger of Sicily in 1117, later the first king of Sicily. I argue that the presence in San Isidoro of objects originating in faraway lands responds to Uraca's aspirational rulership each representing a long distance contact made material. And just to show you one detail, although most of the paint has been lost from the largest of these, of the three boxes, the smallest one is so tiny that my ring can't even fit in it. And it has the painted inscription in Arabic, happiness and prosperity. Some of these issues came up in the first phase of the treasury project, which we published in a special issue of Medieval Encounters earlier this year. And I did bring a copy in case anyone is interested in looking. Uh, others I will pursue during the coming year as a Crest Fellow at CASMA in Washington, DC, as I work on my contribution to the volume in Simon's honor. His absence will be felt even more strongly when I am in the US. When Simon made his move to my home state of Florida, I had been happily looking forward to meeting up with him regularly at the holidays. Instead, we lost him far too soon. My continuing work on Queen Uraka will be the poorer for not being able to sound out ideas with him. But as a topic close to my heart, it is the most appropriate one to offer in his memory. I wish that I could end this talk with a photo of Simon and me from the, our first collaboration in 2002, but none is to be found. So I will just say instead that I'm glad that he got to spend a year in Florida, where the air is sweet and the sunsets gladden the heart. Thank you. Our second speaker um, is Dr. Teresa Whitcomb. Um, she's a currently a Leon Home Visiting Research Fellow um, at the uh, Autonoma de Madrid, um, doing her postdoctoral research project on the secrets of the Moors, imagining Islam in uh, Toledo between 1085 and 1247. Um, Teresa also uh, um, has been awarded a uh, Scrolling Doctoral Research Fellow um, by the Institute of Historical Studies in London uh, that she, um, she held between 2017 and 2018. Um, and before that, uh, Teresa completed her PhD 
at Exeter and supervised by Simon Barton first and then later by Ian Way at Bristol and then Professor Sarah Hamilton uh, at Exeter as well with a, a thesis uh, entitled Between Paris and al Andalus, uh, Bishop Morris of Burgos and his world um, between uh, 12 oh, sorry, 1208 and 1238. Um, before um, that, um, and before uh, starting her PhD at Exeter, uh, Teresa was an MA student um, at the Sorbonne in Paris, uh, and before that she completed her uh, BA at Oxford, so travelling around, uh, talking about movement and mobility, uh, embracing that in full, and she's also published two very interesting articles, uh, one in the Journal Medieval Iberian Studies in 2018, and one in the Bulletin of Spanish and Portuguese um, Historical Studies in 2017. And today she's going to talk about Crusades and Reconquista, a view from 13th century Burgos. Thank you. Thank you so much, Antonella. Um, Is this? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Antonella, and thank you also to Rosa. Relations between Christians and Muslims in medieval Iberia, from the most cosmic and ideological to the most intimate and personal, were a consistent theme in the work of Simon Barton. It was a field to which he contributed an enormous amount. Alongside his own supervisor, Richard Fletcher, he was one of a vanguard of historians to overturn long-held conceptions of Reconquista, demonstrating in a variety of ways that religious ideology was just one of a number of social, economic, and cultural forces that underpinned the history of the peninsula. On numerous occasions, Simon illustrated the permeability of religious borders and revealed the pragmatism that governed the course of both war and peace. One need only think of his work on the Cid. He also wrote about what he described as the newfangled crusading ideology that came increasingly to affect the rhetoric of interreligious conflict by the late 12th century. And he identified a forgotten crusade, a chayen. It is with great gratitude and the warmest of memories that I'm presenting a paper today in honor of Simon. My paper touches on both of the themes I've just mentioned, those ill-named wars between Castile and the Muslim Almohad Empire, and the creeping in of ideas and language from wider Europe, particularly from the papacy concerning crusade. I'll be talking about the first half of the 13th century, a period when, as you will know, the balance of military power shifted somewhat in the peninsula, and Christian Castilian forces, as well as those of other kingdoms, made increasingly strident conquests into the land of the Muslim Empire. The Battle of Las Navas, a victory led by King Alfonso VIII of Castile in 1212, has been the subject of much scholarship, as have the subsequent victories of his grandson, Fernando III. Following Fernando's reopening of war with the Almohads in 1224, the Castilians expanded their territory south, leading to the highly symbolic capture of Cordoba, the colorful capital in 1236, and finally the taking of Seville in 1248. What I would like to talk about today is the way in which, or the ways in which, in the Cathedral of Burgos, far from the military front line, these wars came to be liturgically entangled with wider ideas about crusade to Jerusalem that were being propagated by the papacy. I would like to broach this question by introducing you to a manuscript that I uncovered during the course of my PhD when I was working a lot in the archive of Burgos Cathedral. It's a manuscript that I've been recently, I recently returned to and I've been trying to place, to date, and to contextualize and understand. First, however, an important caveat. I'm at the very outset of this work. Uh, to say that it is in progress is perhaps too, too dignified because I have really more questions than answers at this stage. What I'd like to do is to share this manuscript to such a scholarly audience. Um, it, has not, it has not received any sustained scholarly attention as far as I'm aware. And then I'd like to talk through some of my preliminary ideas stemming from it and all input would be very, very welcome. The text in question is this. Codex 23, folio 2, from the Archive of Burgos. It is a collection of five prayers written in at least three Gothic hands. The manuscript itself has been dated to the 13th century by Demetrio Mancilla in the 1950s and by two other modern paleographers to whom I'm very grateful. But greater precision is very difficult. Folio 3 is the start of a sacramentary. This folio, folio 2, appears to be an addition to that. Leaving aside codicological clues, which may in any case be a red herring, let us now turn to the contents of this manuscript. The text here consists of a series of versicles and responses, 
a central prayer, potentially a collect, which is entitled Prayer in the Time of War Against the Saracens, and three other prayers. On transcribing their context, the warlike nature of these prayers becomes clear. Here's my transcription. The text draws heavily on the Psalms, and as these were so well known, we often have only the first few words of each psalm indicated, as you can see in the square brackets. Particularly notable, however, are a number of close correspondences with a broader series of crusading liturgical texts. The late 12th and early 13th centuries were critically important years in the development of a crusading liturgy in the Latin West, as historians such as Christoph Meyer and Cecilia Gaposchkin have demonstrated at some length. Under Pope Innocent III, in particular, the performance of specific liturgical forms across Christendom by those who stayed at home, as well as by those who went east on crusade, had become extremely important. In 1199, at the dawn of the Fourth Crusade, Pope Innocent had requested that bishops across Christendom should say specific prayers for crusaders and the ongoing efforts to reconquer Jerusalem. The key text in this regard was issued somewhat later, in 1213, namely Innocent's bull, Quia Maior, an encyclical for the Fifth Crusade that stressed the importance of spiritual weapons, prayer, as well as processions, in support of the crusade. This was a specific crusading clamour that should be raised to God, and it was reiterated at the Fourth Lateran Council of 1215. In her recent and very important book on crusading liturgy, Cecilia Gaposchkin has analysed the development of this clamour and has mapped these papally promoted prayers and the slight variants that they were underwent across the Latin West, although there's no known evidence from Castile. As such, I was surprised to realize that the folio before me from Burgos does in fact reflect some significant components of this crusading clamor. First of all, from the book of Judith. Oh, here we are. We have a line which is from a much older canon, from a, a much older Roman canon um, for mass in time of war. Next, we have, however, Psalm 67. Let God rise up, may his enemies be scattered, and let them that hate him flee. This psalm was central to Innocent III's message. It was to be sung every day at high mass. Innocent's successor, Pope Honorius III, also emphasized the importance of the, of the performance of this psalm in the crusading effort. Subsequently, we've got Psalm 19. Lord, save the king and hear us on the day that we shall call to thee. This psalm is found in a French variant of the clamor from the 1240s, as Kaposchkin has demonstrated. It's followed by Psalm 27, which, along with Psalm 67, was deployed in all of the manuscripts analyzed by Kaposchkin as a clamor. Manuscripts. Then we have Psalm 19. May he send help from the holy place and defend thee out of Zion, which is another component of Innocent III's clamour. And finally, the eternally relevant Psalm 101. Lord, hear my prayer, let my cry come to thee. Further down, lower down in the manuscript, um, we have um, a prayer that with all the difficulties and errors having been destroyed, the church may serve you secure in freedom. It's not a psalm, but it's also found in some of the clamor manuscripts. So clearly, we have here in Burgos a collection of psalms in a series of prayers, versicles, responses, or ratios, that correspond very closely to the clamor for crusade, to a liturgical innovation initiated by Innocent III. It's worth adding here that the final three prayers on this folio, um, the last three red, let red letters, um, marked other, are almost direct copies of three prayers that have been attributed to Innocent III himself. Um, but that is in the means Patrologia Latina, and thus far I've been unable to verify this, so um, I'm still looking. Nonetheless, to me, this manuscript seems to provide witness to the arrival in Castile of liturgical elements designed to support crusading efforts to the East and disseminated from the papal court. There is one significant difference, however, the collect, which is this, uh, uh, this text. The collect associated with the majority of the clamor manuscripts is an expansion of Psalm 78. O God, the heathens have come into thy inheritance. They have defiled thy holy temple. They have made Jerusalem as a place to keep fruit. Here in Burgos, we have a very different prayer, concerned not with the reclamation of Jerusalem, nor the inheritance of Christ, but instead with the protection of the king and his army when fighting against Muslim peoples. Um, Lord Jesus Christ, look kindly on your servant, our king, and on his army. Accompany them always in protection and grant that, by virtue of your name and of your most victorious cross, they should powerfully expel the Muslim people 
who always disparage you, and concede that, the barbaric ferocity having been trampled underfoot, they may return to their homes with honor and joy. This is not a psalm. In fact, I've not been able to find any parallels within the crusading clamor that we were just discussing, and nor have I found any parallels anywhere else. Although, as I mentioned, I am at the very early stages of this work. In particular, I'm intrigued by the reference here to the gens maurorum, the people of the Moors. Unlike enemies of the cross or enemies of the faith, the Muslims in this, in this prayer are quite clearly a people, they're a gens. They're a political enemy rather than simply a religious binary. Probably a lot more that could be said about that by people in this room. There is one text that I have found thus far that seems to mirror the wording and tone of this prayer. And that is, in fact, a text that was written in or near Burgos in the 1220s and 30s. I'm referring to the Latin Chronicle of the Kings of Castile, an anonymous text usually ascribed to Bishop Juan of Osma. In chapter 74 of this chronicle, there's reference to the Muslim inhabitants of Al-Andalus as the Gens Maurodum. Moreover, when describing the Battle of Las Navas, the chronicler tells us that, oh, here we go, if the glorious king and his kingdom had incurred any blemish at the Battle of Alarcos, it would be erased that day by the power of our Lord Jesus Christ and of the most victorious cross which the king of Morocco had blasphemed. Now, clearly there are some differences, but also um, I think the parallels are clear with the wording of that prayer about expelling the Muslim people who disparage you by the power of the most victorious cross. We have the same or very similar terminology to describe the conquest of Sepia in 1226, just below, as you can see. One can hardly form any conclusions from the above, but given the change of orientation away from Jerusalem and to protect the king's armies, and given the terminology here, it seems to me most likely that this prayer was a local product, and unlike the liturgy surrounding it, that it stemmed directly from a Castilian milieu. There's much more to be said about the contents of this prayer and much more work I'd like to do, um, and, but now I'd like to move on to think about a possible context for this manuscript. Would it, in fact, make any sense to find traces of liturgical clamor in 13th century Burgos? Now, although Burgos lay far north of the military border, as you can see, its bishops were actively involved in the wars against the Almohads, as was to be expected of any senior clergyman. Bishop Juan Mate, appointed bishop in 1211, fought at the Battle of Las Navas, and he died just two days after the battle ended, almost certainly as a direct consequence of it. However, it is his successor, Bishop Morris of Burgos, on whom I would like to focus today, which will be no surprise to those of you who know me, because my PhD thesis was on him. And here he is with King Fernando III. Morris was made Bishop of Burgos in early 1213, and he remained in the sea until his death in 1238. War with the Almohad Muslims to the south was an issue of importance for him throughout his career, and one he addressed in a variety of ways. He too was involved in the Battle of Las Navas, a battle that was explicitly marketed to Christian peoples beyond the peninsula as being a conflict between Christianity and all who unanimously conspire to destroy the Christians. Morris played a role in the spiritual preparations for this war, and together with the Archbishop of Toledo, Rodrigo Jiménez de Ala, he commissioned a Latin translation of a Quran in 1210. The prologue to this Latin Quran, the Liba al-Qurani, informs the reader that polemical attack on Islam was a way to fight with spiritual weapons. And Morris was just as keen as this, on this as the Archbishop Rodrigo. In fact, he's described as having labored with equal desire and equal passion. Morris was appointed to the Episcopate of Burgos, most likely at the instigation of the king, in the direct aftermath of Las Navas. The earliest record that I have for him as Bishop of Burgos is dated to February 1213. His presence at the battle is suggested by the fact that in December 1212, just a few months afterwards, he was with King Alfonso at the royal court in the south of Castile in Solana, which is not far from Las Navas. Um, well, I won't point to it. As well as being Bishop of Burgos, Morris also had connections with the See of Toledo, where he was Archdeacon from 1208 to 1213, and with the See of Plasencia, a newly established see founded in 1190 in the wake of the military expansion of um, Alfonso VIII. Plasencia being here. This was then very much a frontier diocese, and in 1217, Morris appointed a relative of his, most likely a nephew, to Burgos, who is described as having formerly been at Plasencia, 
and as having taken the title of Cruce Fignatus. A fairly close, if not always compliant, relationship with the papal see was also a feature of Morris's episcopate. And here he stands out somewhat from his contemporaries in the Castilian church, a church which has been characterized by Peter Linehan as unique only in its contempt for Roman authority. Morris attended Lateran IV in 1215, and what is more, he in fact put into practice some of the Lateran canons in Burgos Cathedral in 1230 in his constitution possibly the only bishop to have, to have taken any notice of it. Morris's approach to Jews also marks him out. Despite Innocent III's decree that all Jews should be distinguished with distinctive clothing, this was widely ignored in Castile. The only exception is Morris, who in 1217 complained to Pope Honorius that the decree was not being enforced. Again, in 1229, Morris appealed to the Pope for support in ignoring local tradition and prosecuting Jews who resisted paying the tithe, once again echoing the legislation of Lateran IV. So thus far, we have a bishop who was in touch with papal decrees and sometimes favorable towards them, and who had an active interest in war against the Almohads. However, it was in the 1220s that Morris's military involvement becomes even more important for our purposes. In July 1224, King Fernando III reached a decision to break an ongoing truce with the Almohads and to declare war to the south. It was a decision reached in the context of peace at home and a succession crisis in Al-Andalus, and taken at Carrion de los Condes, where he held a council and was inspired by the Holy Spirit, as we're told in the Latin Chronicle. According to the same chronicle, Morris was one of just two prelates to attend this council. However, there is evidence that these two prelates traveled to get to the council together, that is, Morris and Archbishop Rodrigo. And this evidence relates to an event that I don't think has had as much attention as it should have done, namely the appearance in Burgos in May 1224 of King John of Jerusalem, John of Brienne. King John, who was in Europe to raise support for a new crusade after the failure of the Fifth Crusade, had come to the Iberian Peninsula to find a bride, his third, and had accepted the hand, rather at the last minute, of Berenguela, the sister of Fernando III of Castile. We have extremely little evidence pertaining to the events, but the one record we do have has not been published, and here it is. It's a charter made in Burgos, uh, testifying that Archbishop Rodrigo had been invited there to Burgos to marry John, king of earthly Jerusalem, presumably in contrast to heavenly Jerusalem, um, to Berenguela. Morris invited and requested the Archbishop to come to Burgos in May for the wedding, and the two would certainly have travelled on to carry on by July, as it lay 85 kilometres west of Burgos along the pilgrimage route to Santiago. We have no further information about the visit of King John, but the symbolism of the events, the joining of the Castilian royal house to that of the King of Jerusalem in the aftermath of both the Fifth Crusade and Las Navas, can hardly have been lost on these two prelates, Archbishop Rodrigo and Bishop Morris. And these, let's not forget, were the two spiritual counselors of the king when, two months later, he was inflamed by the Holy Spirit to reopen war against the Muslims to the south. Finally, and perhaps most significantly of all, in 1225, Morris himself became Cruce Signatus. In September 1225, Pope Honorius wrote to Morris and to Archbishop Rodrigo in a letter that recognized the Castilian wars with the Almohads as crusades, worthy of the same indulgence as those who had undertaken the journey to Jerusalem. Morris and Rodrigo were made leaders of the crusade in Castile. Specifically, they were charged with the job of preaching crusade throughout the kingdom. Moreover, we have some evidence to suggest that Morris acted on this instruction. In the Cathedral Archive of Avila, there's a letter, undated but clearly issued not long afterwards, and written by Rodrigo and Morris. It's addressed to all the bishops and vicars of the kingdom of Castile, and it contains a copy of the papal mandate which is described as salubrious and useful to the Christian people. It urges clerics to preach the, this crusading rhetoric to their congregations. There's very little to inform us as to the route Morris might have taken in his tour of Castile. He clearly went to Avalar at some point, and he was in Bruega, which is several hundred kilometers to the east, where he issued a charter in February 1227. In August 1227, he was in Quintana Dueña, so in the north, and he seems to arrive back in Burgos in September of that year, meaning he was absent from roughly October 1225 to September 1227, which would tally with an extended trip around Castile. So, to sum up, 
we have in Bishop Maurice of Burgos a figure who was directly and closely involved in the wars of Fernando III, particularly in the reopening of hostilities in 1224. He also had a direct line to papal ideas about religious warfare and crusade, and he appears to have acted on the suggestion of Honoris III to preach crusade in 1225. Such a combination of influences and events provides, I think, a plausible context for the composition of the prayer that we find in uh, Codex 23. However, I would not wish to do more than hypothesize on this front. Given the amount of work that's still to be done on the Codex in question, um, I'm not trying to do more than suggest one possible context for its production, and there may well be others. Rather, I hope I have deepened and expanded the ongoing discussions that are taking place about the influence of papal ideas in Castile, the interplay between ideological and pragmatic imperatives for war, and the ways in which one particular bishop reacted to all of this. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Teresa, uh, for your paper. And last but not least is Dr. Teresa Tinsley, um, who also um, was awarded a PhD um, at Exeter, um, supervised first by Professor Simon Barton and then completing her project under the supervision of uh, Maria Fusaro at Exeter as well. Her project focused on Hernando de Baeza, uh, a 15th and 16th century author, interpreter, uh, go-between and negotiator, um, whose eventful career and uh, included actually a four-year stint in the Alhambra working for uh, Boabdil, the last Muslim emir, surviving the Spanish Inquisition in Cordoba and working for the Fernandez de Cordoba family in Andalusia and in the papal court of Julius II. In 2018, Teresa also completed the edition and commentary of Hernando de Baeza, Historia de los Reyes Moros de Granada, uh, which I had the pleasure to receive a copy that I treasure in my, uh, on my shelves and is, is a great um, um, work edition and commentary, so please do, do check it out. Um, with also a contextualization by Professor um, Jose Rodriguez Molina. Um, and she's also presented at a number of events and international conferences. Um, but before that, I should also mention that uh, Teresa also runs Alcantara um, Communications, uh, that is a research and communication consultancy on languages and multiculturalism. And today, Teresa is going to talk about reframing the Reconquista, Fernando de Baeza's land on the conquest of Granada. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, yes, well, we're looking at the Reconquista, a uh, subject that Simon did so much to develop. It's a contentious, but still surprisingly tenacious concept um, that's been much debated and critiqued from so many angles. Although the term itself is associated with 19th century Catholic, national Catholic historiography, it is generally accepted that the concept, the idea of recuperation of territory captured from the Visigoths by Islamic invaders, has its roots in medieval Castilian chronicles, which in turn harked back to Isidore of Seville and his Gothic thesis that the Goths were chosen by God to succeed Rome. And somewhere between the two, in what has been seen as the culminating moment of the Reconquista, is the conquest of Granada by the Catholic monarchs in 1492. Um, in his letter to the Pope, written on the very day that he took possession of Granada, Fernando of Aragon proclaimed the achievement as the culmination of a struggle against the Muslims which had gone on for eight centuries. And in a mass, which the first Archbishop of Granada, Fray Hernando de Talavera, wrote to be celebrated annually, marking the defeat of the Muslims, he used a teleological framework in which King Rodrigo's sin in 1211, was destined to be redeemed by the righteousness of the Catholic monarchs in 1492 a narrative of the fall and redemption of Spain, which was to become a feature of standard historiography. All this is well known, but um, 
the reign of Fernando of Aragon and Isabel of Castile, with the union of their kingdoms as its starting block, was a period of immense turmoil and transformation. It was an age of discoveries, creativity, new thinking, new possibilities. One might have expected some reassessment, once Granada fell, of a centuries-old historical narrative based on pride in a Gothic heritage, whose purpose, heavily biased towards Castile, was to legitimate and drive forward territorial expansion on the peninsula. My research focuses on a text which provides an insight into how the story might have been reframed to provide a gentler, more inclusive narrative of Spanish national identity post-1492. Now, uh, Hernando de Baeza's short memoir emerged in the window of opportunity between the conquest of Granada and the accession of Charles V, when Spain became the hub of the Habsburgs' global empire. Um, the work's author, by his own account, acted as an intermediary between Boabdil, Mohammed XI, the, uh, the last emir of Granada, and the Catholic monarchs, in the run-up to the surrender of the city. Various sources indicate that he acted as interpreter between the two sides. From his own testimony, he says he was invited to work for Boabdil, but at the same time, he was receiving instructions from the Catholic monarchs. So it appears that he was facing in both directions, able to understand the concerns of both sides. His text recounts the final years of the Islamic regime and appears to have been composed around 1510 on the basis of notes taken as an eyewitness and from oral testimony collected during the time he was in Granada. Until recently, only two manuscripts were known to exist, one from the second half of the 16th century, the other 18th century copy of the first. Both are incomplete, missing some final pages, with transcriptions published in the 19th century. But um, during the time I was preparing my thesis, three new manuscripts emerged, two of which include an end section previously missing. Uh, and, and as I said, I, as you said, I recently collaborated on a commented edition of the complete work. But my own research has really focused on the author's identity as a way of getting to grips with the deeper meanings in the text. I've been able to establish that he was a high-ranking third or fourth generation Judio Converso from Cordoba, whose family rose to prominence as intimate associates, criados, of the powerful Fernández de Cordoba family, Lords of Aguilar. And it's on the basis of this knowledge that I've been able to put forward a new interpretation of the text arguing that it provides a glimpse of an emerging new historical consciousness of another Spain, a Spain that might have been. This is an image from the beginning of one of the manuscripts, and a quote from a directory of historiography which sums up the rather superficial work, uh, way in which the work has been judged. Quite rightly, as an authentic source, but also as an unproblematic and straightforward account of the events it describes. But seen in the context of the ideologically charged contemporary accounts that were shaping the narrative of the Catholic monarch's historic achievement and an understanding of Baeza's biography, I argue that the work is much less innocent and much more original than Sanchez Alonso suggests here. As I said, the period around the turn of the 15th and 16th centuries was a time of convulsive change and upheaval, with the conquest of Granada seen in the Christian world as a turning point in human history. The transcendental events witnessed in Spain, the autos de fe, the expulsion of the Jews and the biblical images it evoked of a people going into exile, the mass baptisms of moriscos, and the transformation of formerly Muslim towns and cities, 
all this cried out for explanation and interpretation. And in this context, religious explanations, often linked to natural phenomena such as floods, famines, plagues, became very powerful and easy to exploit in canny monarchical propaganda. So to put Hernando de Baeza into context, we need to have a closer look at how the war against Granada and the role of the monarchs in spearheading it was being interpreted. At that time, popes and monarchs were completing, competing in the most overblown representations to show themselves as magnificent and powerful, and the Catholic monarchs were no exception. There's a growing literature on the way in which they were exalted and glorified through public spectacles, dramatic reconstructions, sermons, orations, poetry, and courtly literature, all closely allied to their role in the conquest of Granada. Hernando de Talavera's mass presents the monarchs with all the power and glory of biblical heroes and celebrates the mystic destiny of Isabel and the idea that all Muslims will be converted by the end of days. In Rome, the monarch's supporters portrayed them as glorious crusading leaders of Christendom with a divine mission to overcome the enemies of the faith, a political project which would culminate in the election of the Valencian uh, Rodrigo Borgia as Pope Alexander VI in August 1492. Under the auspices of the monarch's chief propagandist in Rome, Cardinal Bernardino López de Carvajal, the theologian Anio de Viterbo famously published a history of Spain which used an even more grandiose time frame than Fernando's 800 years, zooming out to trace what purported to be a line of 24 ancient kings of Spain back to Noah's grandson, Tubal. And the liberation of Christian captives formed a hugely significant element in many representations of the Granada War. These liberations themselves were staged as set-piece public spectacles in which the monarchs were cast in the role of the redeemers of Christian Spain from the chains of Islam. And the monastery of San Juan de los Reyes in Toledo, founded by the Catholic monarchs and already in construction in 1492, displays on its walls the chains of Christian captives taken from Granada. This emphasized the legitimacy of their conquest, their moral leadership within the Christian world, and the coincidence of divine and monarchical interests. And a period around the half millennium was a time when prophecy and messianism were at their height, and the conquest of Granada gave fuel to, I to the ideas that the apocalypse was nigh. Messianic prophecies and ideas had been circulating around the Aragonese royal family since the conquest of Sicily in 1282. And after the conquest of Granada, expectation increased and was deliberately promoted around the figure of Fernando, who was promoted as the hidden one, the encubierto, who would triumph definitively over evil. Panegyrical poetry fed the growth of messianism around both monarchs as expectations of their divine mission moved from Granada to Jerusalem after 1492. In historical narrative, these ideas about the divine mission of the Catholic monarchs found expression in increasingly providentialist approaches, best illustrated by Andres Bernaldez, whose 1513 history of the Catholic monarchs is almost exactly contemporaneous with Baeza's text. The conquest of Granada was for him a miraculous confirmation of the political theology which blurred the distinction between secular and divine authority, attributed a messianic role to the Spanish monarchs, and not only justified but welcomed violence in pursuit of their aims. Bernaldez presents the reign of Fernando and Isabel as fulfilling a prophecy to rid the country of evil, which he defines as bad Christians, heretics, 
and Moors. And he presents the conquest of Granada, the work of the Inquisition, and the Edict of Expulsion as all part of the same program of action. Hernando de Baeza's view of the Christianization of the peninsula is notable because it resists the demonization of the other. In contrast to the soaring conceit of Anio de Viterbo and his millennial timescale, Baeza only writes about recent history, relying on his own eyes and ears and those of people whom he trusts, as he explains here. And although he goes out of his way to express admiration for members of the Castilian frontier nobility, the Gran Capitan, the Count of Cabra, uh, the Catholic monarchs receive no such treatment. Although he describes Juan Segundo of Castile as glorioso, he dubs Prince Juan as excelentissimo, He's coldly objective when describing Fernando. He describes a rather underhand plan hatched by Fernando to trick the Granadans and storm the city, but reveals that the Granadans got wind of it and Fernando was unable to carry it out. It's the Granadan Emir Boabdil, rather than Fernando, who's painted as an upholder of chivalric values. He says very little about Queen Isabel which in the context of the adulatory rhetoric of the time is possibly as telling as a subtle disapprobation he expresses for Fernando. However, he, pro he portrays Boabdil's mother as a dignified, politically able woman and often uses gender-inclusive language. He talks about girls and boys, men and women, estos y estas, etc. Um, he insists on the virtues and honorability of Muslims who are his great friends. And the use of the word amigo, as Baeza introduces these Muslim characters, seems deliberately chosen to disrupt the ideologically charged Moro enemigo, repeated in so many official documents of the time. He describes Granadans and Castilians taking part in tournaments together and exchanging embassies and gifts, showing that both sides shared a chivalric culture. But he delivers trenchant criticism of the cruelty and despotism shown by the Emir Abul Hassan in his later years. And he depicts a vizier known as El Moulay as deeply untrustworthy. Unlike Bernaldez and another, or another contemporary Alonso de Palencia, who describes Islam as a repugnant sect, he never resorts to essentialist bigotry towards Muslims, but rather stresses individual agency and human potential for vice or virtue. And the characters in this work um, are almost entirely people whose experience or whose identity span the frontier between Islamic and Christian Iberia you can see their political dissidents, envoys, captives, converts, merchants. I particularly like this idea of a mudeja who's called Santa Cruz, which suggests a really um, fluid religious identity. And he even hints at the end there, you can see that one of his great friends says this, this man, this official of the Muslim court, was, uh, he says the, these officials tend to be black Africans. So he, he rejects a clash of civilizations narrative and he admits hybridity. And interestingly, he, he uses sources from both sides. He, his text doesn't fit into a binary Moors versus Christian schema although those who've commented on it have often made the mistake of assuming that it must represent one side or the other. Instead, he represents an integrated view of recent history using both Castilian and Granadan sources. And this is his description of the Battle of Lucena, the 1483 clash in which Boabdil was captured. And it could also almost be 
a film script in a way that it cuts between scenes from the different sides of the battle, representing both perspectives. And he adopts, he adopts the same approach when he describes another earlier battle of the Reconquista, the Battle of uh, La Guerruela, which took place in 1431, showing how each side experienced the event, and it, even explaining that the Arabic name for the battle, Athihara Kibira, means the big fig tree, the same as La Iguerruela. So behind the, the mystery of the Arabic language is a shared meaning. And he highlights the conflicts between Christian and Muslim kingdoms as shared experience, a history both sides have in common. In the additional material that's only just come to light in the last few years, Baeatha explicitly rejects the doctrine of forced conversion to Christianity. In describing his role in the negotiations for the surrender of Granada, he says that the Elches, Christians who'd been taken captive in Granada, often as children, and become Islamicized, should not be forced to return to Christianity against their will, and implicitly, therefore, become targets of the Inquisition. He declares that Boabdil, had he become a Christian, would have been one of the best that ever lived. And I see this as a deeply political statement within the context in which it was written. To sum up, from its roots in medieval Gothic histories to its use in 21st century politics, the narrative of the Reconquista has proved immensely powerful and long-lasting. So much so that it can appear that the idea of an exclusive Christianity triumphing against Islam and represent, repressing Jewish elements in its, his, its heritage was uncontested and inevitable. Yet, as Simon pointed out, the conquest of Muslim territory was not always predominant in medieval Christian strategic thinking. Relations between the faith groups were not consistently hostile, and political alliances were commonplace. This is the pattern that I've picked up with my research several centuries on from Simon's specialist period. Baeatha's account is integrationist, idealistically looking towards the sort of society which might be created once the Kingdom of Granada came under Christian rule. He could see that narratives of the conquest of the city, which were couched in the discourses of the past, which divided the population into victors and vanquished, would hinder, not help, reconciliation and social harmony. Archbishop Talavera's goodwill, patience, and cultural advice to new Christians had been doomed to failure because he'd not recognized that once Granada was being re-envisioned as an inclusively Christian society, the conceptual framework inherited from 13th century Castile also had to change. I've discussed elsewhere the importance of the political context in which Baeza's account was written in 1510. Fernando's position in Castile and especially in Andalusia, after Isabel's death, was strongly contested. There was widespread resistance within the noble, clerical, and conversal circles with which Baeatha is associated to the unchecked use of monarchical power, the inhumane way in which the Inquisition was operating, and the doctrinaire authoritarian worldview which was becoming predominant in shaping Spanish history. Baeatha's text allows us to glimpse how the story of the Christianization of Spain might have been told in a softer, gentler manner than that generally embodied in the concept of Reconquista. And you can download uh, Inando de Baeza's work from my Academia profile. Thank you. to all our three speakers. Uh, there's, uh, we have a few minutes for questions, so if you've got any questions for any of the... The microphone is coming. Just been reminded by Rosa to give my name. 
Alan Williams, University of Exeter. Um, well, could I say that I think uh, Simon would have been impressed and uh, very touched uh, by the wealth and presentation of your research um, and the intellectual voltage within it. Um, I thought they were very fine papers and there's, there are lots of questions to ask, but I will only ask one, uh, and that is of Teresa Whitcomb. And it's just a really a, an observation and it concerns your reference to the uh, prayer and time of war against the Saracens and your comparison with the text from the Latin Chronicle, which I thought was very interesting. And I wondered whether um, this also had a link to the liturgy of Holy Week from memory. There's a, there's a, 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 um, a collect which is used I think on Maundy Thursday, which um, makes some of the references that you um, have used in your presentation. And I just wonder if, if you'd come across that or whether you had any comments about it. Alan, I will look that up. I mean, yes, I haven't, I haven't got as far as doing that yet. Um, I have just looked in the uh well the narrative sources that i know are the chronicles um and the charters that i know but i hadn't um no i haven't looked at that so thank you i'll certainly look that up uh, thank you very much for your papers um the terms uh, Reconquista and Crusade have been used by historians for some time. And only recently, about five years ago, did Rio Saloma, a scholar of the New World, the first full-length study of the historiography of the Reconquista. And um, I think what is very much understudied uh, in history is historiography. We don't have a comparable work dealing with a comparable work to Rio Saloma for the Crusades. And Giles Constable, um, about nearly 20 years ago, spelled out that the historiography of the Crusade is very, very understudied. And even though there have been two works dealing with the historiography of the Crusade, they only proceed along very narrow uh, lines. So I would uh, suggest that the uh, advice of Rio Saloma uh, be taken seriously, that we go back and use the terms that were applied at the time to indicate what was happening. Uh, he doesn't find Reconquista adequate to describe uh, what happened in Iberia. Uh, the reason being that it's an intellectual framework that was originally applied to understand the Napoleonic invasion of Iberia. So it might be a little bit uh, anachronistic and, uh, you know, not appropriate to, you know, read this intellectual framework back into the Middle Ages. Uh, so I'd like your comments uh, uh, dealing with this issue of terminology. Thank you. Um, just to say that um, I, I, I very much use Rios Saloma's uh, work along with many other commentators about the Reconquista. Um, and Rios Saloma, he really starts later on in the 16th century. So he traces the idea of the Reconquista as applied to his earlier history from about the mid 16th century. So I was talking about, um, when I talked about the window of opportunity of Fernando de Baez, I was, I was talking about what happened before those, those ideas really started to get embedded in his in histo historiography. Um, uh, and uh, yes, I've, that I've, I've hung, I've used it, but I, I don't 
accept it as a, as a particularly useful term, except in historiography. Yes, I mean, I, I wouldn't have much to add to that, um, other than Simon, of course, was always incredibly careful and precise with his terminology. Um, and I have tried to be. Um, I've actually avoided in the text of the paper using the words crusade or reconquista too much. Um, I mean, yes, one needs to go, of course, into what do we mean when we say crusade, but in terms of, of a title, it's a useful hook to, to convey quickly to everybody the sort of thing I'm, I'm talking about, but absolutely, yes, it's, it's something that needs to be done very carefully, as you say, and, and with much more um, precision than is, is, is commonly used with these terms. And if I may add, even more recently than five years ago, there yeah. has been a lot published on the issue of the historiography and how Reconquista has been used. Actually, a very recent article published in the Journal of Medieval Iberian Studies, even dealing with the debate between scholars like San Juan and others that are still debating and trying to understand how and to what extent we can use that. So I think we're all aware of that. And as always, we have to use those labels and challenging at the same time those labels to try to... Um, in 20 minutes, uh, present our, our evidence. I think in terms of the War of Granada, um, the idea of crusade came from the fact that the Pope published crusade bulls to enable money to be collected to pay for the war. So, and they were called La Bula de la Cruzada. So that, that's uh, a definition which is quite clear of, about crusade. Thank you all uh, for a fabulous, fabulous, amazing uh, uh, session. I've learned a lot. It appears to my mind that Simon actually read a paper of mine as a reader, and he confirmed it, so I'm very proud to, to say that. Uh, I would have liked to, to ask all of you, but in lack of time, uh, uh, maybe, uh, Therese, maybe you could... Uh, elaborate on uh, Donia Uraka uh, contribution. Uh, for example, uh, I, as far as I can remember, uh, it was John Williams who wrote about the transfer of a certain head that came from the Holy Land first to Leon, and then I think it was given, donated by her to Genmires maybe, am I correct or mistaken? Uh, and of course, her uh, complex relations with, with Helmides. Uh, this is one point. And the other one, only uh, just a line regarding your fabulous uh, contribution with regard to, to liturgical, uh, to crusader uh, liturgy. Only a note that I found in a certain manuscript, a liturgical, n that doesn't have to do with war, but uh, more with. Uh, a, a gender. Uh, there is a prayer in a, a, in the honor. It says, I think, if I'm not mistaken, in a, in a femineo sexu, femine, a femineo devoto sexu. Just a note. Uh, nothing more than that. Thank you. Uh, yes, in. Uh, it's recorded that the, when the head, I think it's St. James Minor, uh, was deposited at Carrion de los Condes, Urraca found out about it, took it from there, brought it to San Isidoro, it was there for an indeterminate time before she gave it to Helmira. So in the discussion of what she does good for churches, not just the despoiling, this is one of the key elements. I have one question for Teresa Martin, uh, Marie, sorry. Um, I was, it's more a technical question. I was wondering about that silk fabric that you show us. If you, you said that it was from the 10th century and I was wondering where does it come from? Which sort of dye did they use and how many threads or if you can tell us a little bit more on the technique that they used to make 
Yes. So in, uh, in my team, Ana Cabrera and Luli Feliciano have been working on the textiles. Um, the publication that I uh, showed it for Medieval Encounters, Ana Cabrera's article has all of the details. What I can say to you at the moment is, unfortunately, the dyes analysis is, gives us dyes that are around the entire Mediterranean. So we have not been able to localize it, which we were hoping to do. Um, and I don't know thread count, but it's an embroidery, so it wouldn't have thread count, right? And when you're talking about the embroidery, not the purple silk? The purple silk. Okay, that one is not from the 10th century, that's 11th, it's Byzantine. Yeah. But also, uh, Anna's article in the special issue is uh, open access, as is mine, so both of those can be downloaded freely. Um, also, a question for Therese. I'm always intrigued by um, the demonizing later on, right? So Luca Zetui writing a century later. Uh, what's happening at that moment that suddenly she comes into the frame and she needs to be re reconfigured in the history of of, uh, of the kingdom, but also of this relationship with, with the church that he's... Um, with Sunny Sudoron specifically, but what's happening or why then? Um, and I'm also fascinated by the ring, by the ring holder. Is that, the, the, um, it's so oh, tiny. It's so tiny, it can't um, be a ring holder, right? Yeah, so what do you put in, it's a, so it's a set of ivories, right? So the, the largest one is about that big, big one, and then medium, and then the tiny one. So the idea would be you give the gift of this gorgeous ivory, but that's not the gift. And you open it up and you take out what appears to be the gift, and that's not the gift. Then you take out the tiniest one, and that's the only one with an inscription. And whatever is in there is the real gift. So is it a gem, maybe? Mm. Yeah. And as for uh, Queen Uraka being written, rewritten later, I, it, I mean, it must have to do with the fact that although she could rule in her day and keep control of things, by the time you're looking back on her a century later, having a woman at the helm does not fit with what these churchmen want. So there's got to be a reconfiguring of how you remember them. To me, what's most interesting about Lucas of Tui is that he's writing it from San Isidoro. So he's there living in that environment, knowing the stories and choosing what he passes on to us. And I think that that's how we also have to see the, the collection of the treasury. What has the, the um, monastery itself decided are worthy of keeping and passing down to posterity? because it's like an, an archive. You don't keep everything, you keep what matters. And somehow this collection from this period of 10th to 12th century is what matters most. I've got one uh, more question for, um, for Therese since we are continuing um, on that line and he's, there's one in interesting um, aspect you mentioned in your presentation about the disconnect between the visual and the textual evidence that we have. Um, but, but I was wondering whether when it comes to the, uh, the objects that you were saying are clearly from uh, lands far away as a symbol of power networks connections, whether we have any evidence that those are coming from, are these part of diplomatic embassies that were taking place or anything? Is there any other way we can gather that yeah. information? Yeah. This, this is the question. We have visual evidence. We do not have written evidence. Even the uh, donation of 1093 by Fernando and Sancha is a 12th century document. So it doesn't mean that we don't believe that they gave all of that fabulous stuff that it says, but it does make us stand back and say, okay, why was it rewritten in the 12th century um, as uh, Encarnacion Garna Martin Lopez has demonstrated, taken from at least three different charters that were put together to make one magnificent charter that is, curiously, the same size as Queen Urraca's charters. And I've got one more point following up um, from that, and you can tell that I'm recently obsessed with diplomacy because that's why I was mentioning, and it's one interesting, um, word that I 
I picked up from your uh, from Teresa's um, presentation, you were talking about um, Hernando de Baeza as an in intermediary, mm -hmm. uh, which is interesting because it's, it's, you didn't say necessarily a translator, neither an ambassador. So can you, can you elaborate a little bit more about what is the role of an intermediary and what does kind of differentiate that? Well, um, in the Chronicles, uh, they're often called spies, espias. And uh, I think, I don't like that word because it gives, it, it sums up an idea of uh, betrayal of one side or another. And what seems to be uh, Hernando de Baeza's role was actually a conciliator, somebody who, who helped to oil the wheels of diplomacy and helped to, to create the, um, uh, the, the, the treaty, the Capitulaciones de Granada. And that, that's it, it, in many ways what, the, what interpreters see their role as today, oiling the wheels of diplomacy. Um, uh, and and he, as I said, he, he does appear to be facing both sides. Thank you. Mm -hmm. There's more a point of information for uh, Teresa Tinsley. Um, you started off uh, the frontispiece of, of your book, The Christ Child Holding the Pomegranate. Could you say something more about that uh, painting? Um, it's a Botticelli. That's what it, I It's from the La Madonna della Melagrana. Um, and, and actually, it, I think it's from, <coughs> it's from the late 15th century. I don't know if, when it was painted, uh, this, there was the symbolism of Granada and the Christ child holding Granada in his hands. I don't know if that was intended. I've also found a drawing by Raphael, which was, is a bit later, which was 1504 or, or so, when I think the, the symbolism of the Granada, uh, of the pomegranate representing Granada, would have been definitely understood in Spanish Rome at the time. But the reason the, um, the, the picture, the image appealed to me was it's a very gentle idea of Christianization, of uh, yeah, the Christ child holding Granada, if you like, in its hands in a very gentle way. And that's what appealed to me and why um, I, I, I thought it summed up this different approach to Christianization. Okay. If there are no uh, more questions, and just to keep everything um, on time, I would like, first of all, to thank um, once again our three speakers for an incredibly interesting, stimulating, and as you might have clearly seen, emotionally charged um, session for being here today. Thank you very much.